This video is sponsored by Squarespace. Aging wine is a fascinating topic as wine is one of very few agricultural products that can improve over time, sometimes achieving its peak decades after the harvest. I want to explore this in more detail, so I prepared three pairs of the same wine, one young and one decades old, in order to show you what actually happens in the bottle during maturation. Let's go. I've always been interested in the aging process. When I started learning about wine, I was impressed by people who were able to pick up a glass and tell me instantly how long they think this wine is going to last. Today I know of course that that's not how it works. Experts taste the wine and based on their past experience with that style or producer, they give an estimate of the wine's life expectancy. That estimate is usually based on the presumption that the wine is going to be stored in perfect conditions at consistent and cool temperatures in a dark and humid locations. But even then, experts usually are fairly conservative with their estimates and sometimes they are off by years. It is a bit like asking your veterinarian how long your dog is going to live. They will look at the life expectancy for that breed and the medical history of your dog and then they might give an estimate not knowing whether your dog will get cancer tomorrow. In my opinion great wines should be aged as they become more complex, interesting and palatable over time but there is a risk of opening the bottle too late and tasting the wine past its peak. It's sort of like watching Mel Gibson in What Women Want instead of Mad Max. So in order to understand the aging process better I've prepared three pairs of age-worthy wine one young, one old, in order to find out what a difference a few decades make. So we're going to start off with the Zucardi Malbec Q from Mendoza in Argentina and we're going to taste the 2004 vintage against the 2020 vintage. Zucardi is a family-owned estate established in the 1960s. Those two wines are actually fairly similar when it comes to the analytics. They both have roughly 14% of alcohol and also the sugar and acidity level are pretty similar. But the main difference is that this wine was not aged entirely in oak. It was also aged in concrete tanks. Malbec is certainly a grape variety that can age. It has lots of color, tannins and substance and therefore it's able to survive longer periods of aging. But let's see how, well, how they differ right now, those two wines. The reason why I'm starting with the red wines is that the older version of the white wines is older. So I'm just kind of working my way back from the youngest couple to the oldest. Both wines were bottled under the same closure. They both have DM10 corks. So I'm not 100% sure whether this one was actually recorked with a DM cork or whether they already had DM corks back then. But yeah, well, same closure. The closure can impact the aging process of the wine as well. DM tends to be fairly consistent from what I heard. DM10, I think, means that it's actually made for aging the wine for 10 years. So this might actually be too old for this cork so maybe there's maybe there's an issue because of that i don't think so i've tasted that wine before at the master of wine symposium and they kindly gave me some bottles of the older wines so that i can set up this tasting and back then the the wine showed pretty well so looking at the two wines side by side i actually didn't know that i could swirl two glasses at the same time but here you go um you can see differences in colors. So the old wine, the 2004 vintage, is definitely more brown towards the rim. So there's more of a garnet color uh, towards the rim, whereas the 2020 is really dark purple. There's almost no browning visible. When it comes to the flavor, it's actually quite fascinating. The 2004 feels a little bit more together. I think the 2020 just feels very young, very primary, very intense fruit flavors. Whereas this doesn't feel old at all. It just feels a little bit more complex, a little bit more interesting. There's plum character coming through together with blackberry and cassis flavors. There's a little bit more spice there as well. I assume that this has maybe also something to do with the fact that this has seen more oak. Whereas this? Is really, really fruity, a little bit of 
of smokiness coming through as well. But yeah, this is just more complex. The H wine is more interesting, more integrated, more, yeah, more multi-layered. On the palette, both wines actually still have a lot of grip. I mean, the 2004 is almost 20 years old, but it's still very well together and the tannins are intense and ripe. The 2020 has a little bit more bite to it. So I think the tannins are actually a little too aggressive at this time. It's not a wine necessarily that you have to age, but uh, this feels a little bit more harmonious, a little rounder. Tannins over time get longer and therefore aren't as harsh on your palate anymore after a few years of aging. So this shows in this wine for sure. What is fascinating, I think, in this lineup is that the Argentinian Malbec, not necessarily a wine style that people put away in their cellar for a long time, is actually still very young, very fresh, very vibrant after close to 20 years of aging. So the next wine is one that I've talked about on this channel a few times already because it's so special and super interesting. It's the Tyrol that one Semillon from Hunter Valley in Australia. The wine is made from the grape variety Semillon, which is not necessarily one of the more popular grape varieties in the wine world. And here in Hunter Valley, it actually produces a very low alcohol, dry white wine that in its youth doesn't really smell and taste like much. But over time, it gets complex and super interesting. So I'm super excited to have the 1998 vintage to taste next to the 2015 vintage, which is one of their most recent releases. Tyrrell writes about the vintage that 1998 was a landmark Semillon vintage in the Hunter Valley, a warm and compressed vintage period, produced Semillons with intense, powerful flavors that have aged incredibly well. well let's see. 2015, on the other hand, was a typical Semillon vintage in the Hunter Valley, Warm, dry conditions throughout winter, followed by rain at Christmas, produce semillons with good fruit weight and a soft acid profile. Soft acid in Tyrrell's case means seven grams per liter, which is actually pretty high, but the 1998 was at 7.6. Both wines are at 10.5% of alcohol. So let's open them up. But before I do, I just have to say this is such an amazing bottle. It looks but well, this actually looks like a urine sample. It doesn't look look classy at all, which is maybe a good thing because that kind of hides how delicious this wine is likely going to be. This is the new version, which, well, isn't as exciting. I think this is actually a pretty amazing bottle. Both wines are under screw cap, which means that we shouldn't have any issues with cork taint. Wines under screw cap often have the tendency to age a little bit slower in my experience. So with a wine style like this, that is actually supposed to be aged, it's maybe a little bit counterproductive to put it under screw cap, but they've done that for a long time and I don't think they are going to change it. So when you look at the color, you can see straight away that the 1998 is quite a bit more golden in color, darker and more intense. The 2015 is a little more light, a light golden color. This is very typical for white wines. As they age, they actually get darker first golden and at some point they turn brown, whereas red wines get lighter in color. They go from purple also towards brown. When it comes to winemaking, they haven't really changed much between 1998 and 2015. Both wines were fermented in stainless steel. They spend a very short amount of time on the lease and they get bottled very early and the wines have to spend at least six years at the winery in bottle before being released. The 2015 smells of lemon zest, lemon tart. There's a little bit of cake flavor coming through, a little bit of gingerbread aroma. It's very fine and super elegant. The 1998 is very exciting. It's not a wine that jumps at you. It's quite elegant and delicate, but it reminds me a little bit of vintage champagne. It has those brioche flavors together with ripe citrus fruit flavors. It's just so interesting and complex and feels still so young. It also smells of cookies and cream, even though this is not a sweet wine, but it's just, yeah, 
There's just a lots of dimension to this wine. The 2015 is so fresh. It just has lots of acidity, very low alcohol, basically no sweetness. So there's not a lot of body and sweetness there to cover up the acidity. So it's just really fresh and grippy. I would say it's a little bit well, too fresh and grippy. Even for a German tongue, this is just very intense, very grippy. I know that this in the future will become more mellow and round, but well, let's just taste the older wine in comparison. It's fascinating. This has more acidity, even less sugar, and still it feels more round, more balanced, more delicious, just because it is a little bit older and through the chemical processes in the bottle, the wine has become more harmonious. So now the acidity is kind of, yeah, a little rounder. It feels a little waxy, spicy on the palate. It's just a really extraordinary wine style. And I would love to revisit this in 10 years because I think it will still be delicious. I don't actually know when those wines tend to go from perfect to not so great anymore. But I'd imagine that this can easily age another 20 years. For me, this is a 98 point wine, even though this is probably not the style that people would expect when they read a high rating like that. It's just a very interesting wine that you first have to get used to and then I think you will enjoy it. Before I continue with the wines, let me talk about the sponsor of this video, Squarespace. I recently launched my own website, ConstantinBaum.com, and I used Squarespace to build it. I found the platform really intuitive and easy to use, even with zero programming experience. I just selected the template, adjusted the design and features according to my requirements. Once everything was set up, I clicked launch and the website was live. On the website, you can sign up for my free newsletter that I'm going to launch. It will be packed with information on the wine world and with Squarespace email campaigns, that was super easy to set up. If you like, you can also integrate an online shop or sell merch on Squarespace. So if I ever come up with my Baum glass, I could sell that through my website as well. So check out squarespace.com for a free trial. And once you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com slash Baum and use promo code ConstantinBaum in capital letters for 10% off of your first purchase of a website or domain. The link and the code can be found in the description below this video. Thank you Squarespace for sponsoring this video. And now let's get back to the wines. The next couple has an age difference that you would normally only see between billionaires and their supermodel girlfriends. I'm talking about the Schloss Johannesberger Riesling Auslese Rosalack. This is the 1964 vintage and this is the 2021 vintage. Schloss Johannesberg is one of the most important estates in the German wine scene. It has a long history in the Rheingau. It is entirely focused on Riesling and it's said to be the birthplace of the Spätlese, if you want to believe that story. Spätlese is a Prädikatstufe in the German wine law. Below that is Kabinett, which I made a video about a few weeks ago. And above that is Auslese, the wine style that we're tasting today. The 1964 vintage was a very good vintage in Germany, producing ripe and concentrated wines. What is interesting is that these two wines are both Auslesen, but this one is actually at 9% of alcohol, 45 grams of residual sugar, while this one is at 7.5% of alcohol and 111 grams of residual sugar. So the 2021 vintage is more than twice as sweet in terms of sugar than the 1964, which is probably, well, part of a trend in Germany. The Prädikatstufen are getting more and more concentrated and sweet as the weather is getting more and more warm. So lots of cabinets are actually declassified Spätlesen, lots of Spätlesen are declassified Auslesen and a few Auslesen are declassified Bern Auslesen. So let's hope that I can get the cork out in one piece. I can. 2021 wasn't an easy vintage. It was quite wet and warm and therefore there was quite a lot of humidity and disease pressure. But there are some delicious wines coming out of that vintage. They tend to be a little less ripe and 
well, a little more on the fresh side, which can be great for sweet wines. So the color difference is most pronounced in this pair. The 64 is really golden in color, very intense. There's no browning, it's just gold. While the 2021 is pretty light in color. It's like a light yellow color. And you wouldn't necessarily guess that this is a sweet wine just by looking at it. When it comes to the aroma, the 21 is really still a baby. It smells a little bit of apple. There's not much going on. It's a little bit backward. It doesn't really, well, doesn't really show you its full potential. The 64 is much more exciting. It smells of ripe peaches, apricots, pineapple. There's also this slightly woody, spicy note coming through, which makes the wine quite complex. There's just much more going on here. Due to the sweetness level, I will taste the 64 first and then the 2021 because, well, this is just much less sweet. On the palate, it's very fresh and lively. I mean, if you look at the stats, that this could also be a cabinet wine. It doesn't really feel like an Auslaser to me. It doesn't have like the richness and concentration, but it's just, it's just delicious. There's quite a lot of power there, concentration. I would actually say that this is at the end of its drinking window. I wouldn't keep this for another 60 years for sure. I think it will keep for another few years, but, but uh, the way it presents itself right now, I think is kind of everything you'll get. It won't get much better than this. The 2021 is actually delicious. It's very intense. The acidity is very high at 10 grams per liter. The sugar level is even higher at 111 grams, but there's a lot going on here. So it's quite concentrated, grippy, juicy. I'm guessing that this will be amazing in a few decades. Right now though, it just feels a little bit disjointed and a little bit harsh. I think it just needs to come down a little bit more to really be as enjoyable as it can get. Yeah, I would really love to taste this 21 again in 60 years to see how it developed. I hope you enjoyed this video half as much as I did. It clearly showed to me that you should age great wines. In all of the three pairs, the aged wine was actually the better wine, while the younger version of it didn't quite get to the same level. My highlights were certainly the Turles and also the 1964 Rosalac from Schloss Johannesberg. But all of the wines actually showed great. And I would like to do this tasting again in 10, 20 years with those three wines and their younger counterparts to see how they have developed. I'm pretty sure that all three wines would actually be better than they are today. So thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this video, then please like it down here. Subscribe to my channel if you haven't done so already. My question of the day is, what is your favorite, young or old? Let me know down below in the comments. I hope I see you guys again very soon. Until then, stay thirsty.